Souls-likes used to be a novelty, games that follow the core design principles of From Software's iconic titles. The original Lords of the Fallen in 2014 fell into that category, trying to capitalize on a budding trend yet falling short of replicating the type of experience that made Souls games so good. The upcoming Lords of the Fallen is a second shot for the series, acting as a sort of reboot. But the subgenre has evolved drastically in the years since, and it takes a lot more to grab the attention of folks amid the sea of Souls-likes we see today. And after playing through roughly two hours for preview, it's clear that developer Hexworks has a better understanding of what makes a good Souls-like click this time around. While this new entry is loosely tied to the original, 2023's Lords of the Fallen is completely rebuilt, committing to a much darker fantasy world and offering stronger RPG elements. The flow of combat that bogged down the first game is gone, and its place is a fine-tuned rendition of that familiar, heavy, and consequential style of combat where every move is a risk-reward scenario and dodge rolls are your best friend. It's responsive and relatively fast-paced, and from the boss fights and enemy encounters I experienced, the process of understanding attack patterns and exploiting opportunities while managing stamina felt right. An impressive showcase of how it's doing things better this time around is in the very first boss fight against Pieta, she of the Blessed Renewal. Pieta is a knight that towers over you and wields light-based magic utilized in swift, far-reaching strikes of her sword, devastating AoE spells, and summoned avatars that attack you. And of course, there's a second phase to the fight, where she transforms into an angel-like being who soars across the combat arena and casts even more dynamic light spells that home in on you. Defeating her turned out to be the kind of challenge expected of the genre's greats. It took me three tries, but with each attempt, I felt myself getting better, gradually excelling at reacting to her attacks rather than succumbing to cheap tricks and banging my head against the wall. Now there are several ways to build yourself in Lords of the Fallen thanks to fluid RPG systems that, again, is reminiscent of the Souls games. While you choose a class template when creating your character, it doesn't necessarily dictate how your character grows, rather it provides a starting point and a direction you can take as you progress. For the preview, I went with a class that mixed both sword and bow for close range melee and long range flexibility. This also means I wasn't able to explore the three pronged magic system, nimble glass cannon style builds, or any of the variations in between, though that is another exciting aspect of this game. The moment to moment in my Lords of the Fallen demo ticked most of the souls boxes I have when it comes to combat, but this game distinguishes itself in its concept of dual worlds. Axiom, the land of the living, is more or less the normal dimension, but it exists in parallel with the umbral realm, the land of the dead. The two realms run simultaneously as you play, which takes advantage of tech on latest gen platforms. It's similar to The Medium, or Titanfall 2's effect and cause mission, but spread across an entire sprawling dark fantasy world. It's fair to say that this is the game's defining feature since the duality of Axiom and Umbral manifests in several ways in both exploration and combat. While in Axiom, you can hold your Umbral lamp at any time to peer through what your immediate surroundings look like in the Umbral realm. Oftentimes, it'll reveal alternate paths to otherwise unreachable locations, like bridges built off of the bodies of dead monsters leading to loot, or ponds dried up in the alternate realm letting you move forward to other spots. And these are just a few examples I saw. While holding up your lamp as a peek into that realm, you can transport yourself into the umbral to fully explore the decrepit alternate reality. The catch is, the umbral realm is a dangerous place full of undead enemies, and the longer you stay in here, the more its powerful wraiths threaten and hound you. Another catch is that phasing into the umbral is a sort of one-way ticket, and the only way back is returning to a vestige save point. This dynamic introduces a puzzle element to exploration since there are platforms you can control for traversal and umbral-only paths to critical areas of the world. More importantly, it creates a push and pull with tension and curiosity, leaving me interested in inspecting my surroundings just a bit closer and thinking if it's worth the risk, and that perpetuates throughout the entire game. Here's another kicker about the parallel worlds. Remember how I mentioned I was able to defeat Pieta in just three tries? That was thanks to the Umbral Realm. When you die in Axiom, you immediately resurrect in that same spot 
in the Umbral Realm and the fight continues. Lords of the Fallen is shaping up to be challenging in the ways you expect from Souls-like games, but giving players a second chance, Umbral caveats and all, is also a nice way to mitigate the exhaustion often felt in games so punishing. Like the resurrection mechanic in Sekiro, by no means does this make encounters easy, but having a rebuttal in tight situations is much appreciated. When it comes to story, brief cutscenes, audio log-like spirits, and esoteric dialogue provide a vague sense of narrative throughout the world, which is another core pillar. It almost feels like one of those moments when you notice something clearly trying to be its influence. The merits of how well this new game executes is an assessment for the full experience, however. Because as you learn more about the characters at your sanctuary base, or uncover new details about each boss's lore through their designs and backstories, the more Lords of the Fallen will reveal itself. And given that lamp was intended for me, should his paladin fall? And yet now here you are, lamp bearer. Well, it seems I was right to doubt the value of a dark crusader's work. Creative director Cesar Vitosu didn't seem shy about wearing the influences on his sleeve. As he showcased other regions and boss fights in late game areas, I got a sense of the foreboding vibe that perpetuates in Lords of the Fallen, and the Dark Souls familiarity that followed throughout. But looking out to the horizon from Skyrest Bridge, the game's starting area before taking on Pieta, you can see a godlike hand resting in the distance, and looking up in the sky you can catch a glimpse of the six beacons shining upwards, marking the locations you must discover to cleanse the land and defeat the demon god Adir. I see a vast and interesting world, I just don't know if I'm in the right gaming mood to go down this kind of rabbit hole again quite yet. In the year 2023, the Souls likes have grown and expanded with countless takes on the formula, and even common mechanics have found their way into other games in some form. From Software has also transcended the foundation it created with the likes of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice and Elden Ring, setting the bar even higher, and for open world games at large with the latter. But a revolution in a genre isn't always necessary, right? And sometimes a good take on an established formula is what folks want. Familiarity is a word I've used a lot here because, for better or worse, that sums up my short time with Lords of the Fallen, even with all its unique quirks and own bespoke world building that freshen the experience. However, that'll be music to the ears of those looking for the closest thing possible to another Dark Souls, because reservations and all, Lords of the Fallen seems to be doing that kind of game really, really well. But we won't know for sure until the game launches on October 13th for Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, and PC. Yeah!